This is episode 82 of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast, and I'm your host, John S. In today's episode, we'll speak with David B. Bull, author of Parallel Universes, The Story of Rebirth, a memoir. David, how you doing? I'm very well, John. How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Um, are you up in Wisconsin? I am. I'm in the southeastern Wisconsin, Milwaukee area. Absolutely. Beautiful state. I was reading your book and you were... You were writing about growing up around the lake, and it reminded me of some of my drives through Wisconsin, and mm. uh, beautiful area up there. Mm, it certainly is. Okay. Um, so you wrote a book um, called Parallel Universes, and um, it's your memoir of uh, recovery uh, from a uh, alcohol and drug addiction. When I first started reading the book, I was I was blown away by the foreword written by uh, Jovita uh, Bidlovska. What a great job she did. I'm, I'm going to have to read her book, Drunk Mom. I've I've not read that before. Mm-hmm. She did do an excellent job. She she understands this uh, to a level that most don't. Mm-hmm. And she was she talked about I mean, a lot of your book talks about shame and the, the impact that shame has on on us becoming addicts. And She talked about inherent shame, and she was uh, referencing Gabor Mate a lot in the foreword. And, Mm -hmm. you know, a big part of your story is that you were adopted. You were relinquished from your biological parents. And she was she was writing about how these events that happened to us, even before we're maybe even aware of them, do have an impact on us just physically, just chemically. The stress that a mother might be feeling when she's carrying a baby is passed on to that to that child while they're developing. And I found that pretty interesting. It's interesting and it's it's almost intuitive once one thinks about it. It would be silly for us to say, boy, I can't imagine that that would have an effect on a developing individual later on. It, it actually makes some great logical sense. But but what I have to tell you is that as I was undergoing the process, it, it, it didn't even occur to me, right? I mean, what one grows up in an environment where they learn certain lessons, rather unspoken lessons, expectational lessons, uh, true life lessons, and they develop a perspective that, that guides them. And my perspective, of course, was that all of that was an outside issue. Mm-hmm. And particularly when I came into the 12-step fellowships, it wasn't discussed, and I wasn't encouraged to discuss it, not only by the fellowships themselves, but by the way I had been brought up in life. You know, I, I was brought up in a, a happy, supportive family whereby th- there were no issues surrounding this, so so why question it? But the fact of the matter is, is as, as you've suggested by Jovita's beginning of the book, it, um, it had to be investigated, right? I, I had to take a look at that as it related to my addiction. Other, otherwise, I was never going to get at that, that complete solution that I was looking for. Right. And prior to the age of six, as you were growing up, you you were you were you were loved and cared for in your in your home. You felt that adoption was a good thing. Well, absolutely. I, I would even take it further than that. Not not only was it normalized, I can't remember a time not knowing. Right. So so people when they typically tell their adoption stories, they often tell about the time that they were told by their parents or their caregivers that they were adopted. I don't remember that as an event because it was always part of growing up. And it was proudly talked about. You were adopted. You were chosen. We wanted you. So, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was always normalized in the family in which I was growing up. And as a result, we were all made to think that that would be a supportive experience. Yeah. Yes. And then something happened when you were six years old. You were with some friends and you were sharing with them this story of your adoption and this, this I think, was what I would call a resentment. It was something that you relived later in life. It was something that had a had an impact on you. It was it was the shame I think that you talked about in your book. That their reaction was not what you expected. Their reaction was that you were somehow different. And do you want to talk about that a little bit and how that experience um, impacted you for, I guess, the rest of your life? Absolutely. Well, you know, it's one of those things. We, when we think back to our childhood, we know that we learn from brain science today that we don't remember things as though it was a movie playing. We remember bits and pieces. And of course, this is literally the earliest memory I have from my childhood. Was at age six, and I had I had brought a couple buddies home that I, that I 
had been playing with that day and I had told them so proudly and I thought this was a really cool thing that I was adopted and and I could still in my mind I can picture the looks on their faces they were they just could not believe it and it started to occur to me right then and there wait a minute maybe there's something to this that I don't know anything about so of course I, I brought these friends home to my mother who was working at home and I said mom tell them tell them, please confirm my identity and, and this is the language I use today I didn't use this at age six but please tell them that I was adopted and she did proudly and matter of factly because that's the way we spoke about it and it was at that time that I, I realized this is something different. This is something that's not okay. These friends let me know that there was something wrong with this being adopted thing. And from that, of course, I have a very complex mind, as many of us do. It didn't just end there. What, what, what actually happened was, is I kept thinking, well, wait a minute. If this family of mine has been telling me this is cool all along and it's really not, can I, can I, can I trust them? Yeah. Is this is this something that I can trust them for? And can I trust the world to 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 send me messages that that would allow my perceptions to be healthy? And that that kind of defined what I would say is the majority of my relationships going forward from that day in any number of different forms. Um, I was always wondering if I should be trusting individuals and the message that they were trying to send or if they right all the thing that goes along with it. Are they being manipulative? Are they trying to get a desired response out of me? Are they blowing smoke up my backside in order for me to behave in a certain way? And it defined who I was. And of course, throughout that process, the, the brain, my brain is very active and questioning oneself every day is, is really difficult. Um, questioning one's identity. Who am I? every day and 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 to, to where did I come from it's, it's a it's a natural question for human beings to have but this one had no answers that I had no access to any of those answers so it remained I guess um, I don't even know how to characterize it. it it remained a mystery I suppose until there came a time in my adult life when I was able to actually able to get some more facts surrounding um, the relinquishment and I was able to assimilate them better into my life. And th by the way, that's the, the title in part parallel universes. I, it was a part of my life that was not assimilated for many decades. And once I did, I found out not only that I was whole, but I could stay sober and sane and have, have a life that I never dreamed of. Another thread that went through the book was, I guess, the importance of forming connections with other people and the difficulty in forming connections with other people. And so it seemed like, you know, that that shame that you felt from that experience with those friends of yours kind of created an obstacle in a way of forming those connections with other people that you would later, um, I don't know if you would say overcome, but you used alcohol and drugs as a way to somehow find those connections, I'm thinking. I think that's a, a, a very good analysis, John. And I can tell you, I can remember when I started using alcohol at age 13, I, you know, I, I, as I was analyzing this, I thought, well, did I use it as a so, social lubricant? So many right. people, whether they turn out to be alcoholic or not, talk about using alcohol to lower those inhibitions and what, and is that why I did it? And I don't think so. I did it because it was presented to me. I did it out of peer pressure. I was in an environment where I was offered the alcohol. And what I found, John, immediately is it provided a solution. It, it wasn't a solution to that social anxiety. I literally felt connected. And this is the ultimate answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I thought me and those other people, because I thought everybody drank like I did, found the solution to life, this connection. Mm -hmm. We found this higher level with which to um, connect with one another, attach to one another, and alcohol was allowing us to do that. And that was my initial hook with alcohol. You know, we hear people say, I, I knew from my first drink I was drinking alcoholically. Well, in retrospect, I can say that, but but for, for different reasons. I mean, right. it gave me the attachment that I was missing and it slowed my the thought of my, my brain process down. I wasn't constantly judging myself and shaming myself and beating myself up for being different because in that moment, again, in the perception, the assumption incorrectly was that everyone was drinking like I was, we had found this solution together. Right. And that's a very odd way to define relationships early in one's life because without that social lubricant, without that alcohol, that makes mean that most situations in life you're, one is not going to feel connected. One is not going to feel like they reach that new level with other individuals. And as a result, they're going to feel separate or judged or shamed or whatever the case may be. Right. And that is basically what happened as you're, as you're drinking progress as a young person. Um, you know, you, you began having, oh, you know, you had the car accident where you were reluctant to tell the, the person that you, that you, um, that you damaged their car. And then when you finally mm -hmm. did and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't accept that your, your, your truthfulness very well. And so it's, <laughs> It seemed like that, you know, that that initial desire for connection and using alcohol to um, get those connections was ultimately actually driving driving you away from Absolutely. and separating you from the rest of the people. 
Absolutely, right? I mean, if, if we look at the criteria for substance use disorder and alcoholism, yes, I was exhibiting that criteria at that time because it had a significant negative impact, not only on relationships, but my sense of self. And it was a, it was a spiral, as you could see, right? I mean, if you want to feed shame, I had found the perfect way to feed shame, right? It was, it was yeah. to, to think I, was, I could dr- drink it away with alcohol, and then I would do something that would ultimately show to others that that there was something wrong with me and then it would keep going and going and going and ultimately that's just it maybe this isn't the appropriate time to interject this but uh-huh. I, but I think about this a lot and, and you've talked about the shame theme yeah. you know, there was an excellent um, professor down at I believe the University of Houston by the name of Brene Brown who years ago talked in one of her TED talks about shame and she she correctly I think identified shame as being different from guilt. Guilt is something that we feel about something we've done and shame is about how we feel about who we are, right? So mm-hmm. guilt is, oh, I did something wrong and and shame is there's something wrong with me, right? So so she talks about this. I think that's really accurate. And she thinks she opened up a great discussion, but I ultimately, I think it's even more than that because here, here's how the brain process works with regard to shame. So yes, my brain starts out and says, yep, there's something wrong with me, but then it keeps going and it says, wait a minute, something's wrong with me and everybody's aware of it. But everybody's aware of it except me. So what happens and what that means is that this thing controls my behavior, but it does so beyond my perception. So I keep forgetting that there's something wrong with me. And ultimately, this forgetting is going to make me embarrass myself in some way to the world that is so painful, but also irreparable. So therefore, as the spiral keeps going, you know, there's, there's something even more wrong with me than I could even contemplate. Not only it, do I feel the shame, but I'm powerless and I'm hopeless at this time. And that experience that you just described was exactly the start of that process. Now, it took me decades to deconstruct that thought process, mm-hmm. but you identified exactly what had happened, right? He, here, what I think I'm doing is, and, and at the time I was calling alcohol my medicine and I still right. would in some types of narratives, it, it ended up not being, and it was coming back to bite me like a boomerang much earlier in my life than I ever could have imagined. And you know, when you, you the title of the book, Parallel Universes, um, the when I was reading the book, and and you mentioned it a few times, you know, it's the existence of these two realities at the same time. It's like um, alcohol makes me feel connected, but I'm not connected. <laughs> right. Know? I right. I I'm not an alcoholic, but my life is falling apart. It's like it, there's a certain part of us that's aware of what's going on but then we have this denial mechanism that i guess is a way of us to cope with whatever that reality is that's right that's right and then the, the, the way my brain works anyway is it 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 confabulates that evidence up front and then later on it questions the very evidence it confabulated so right so so oh yeah so oh boy i'm seeing these consequences my friendships are, are starting to get pushed away i'm doing things that are dangerous and, and the next day or something once that that panic has passed oh i just overreacted there's that where there wasn't as much to it as i thought i just took that out of context right this is this is how we rationalize things with the alcoholic brain so the whole recovery process seems to be for you um from from what i got from reading the book anyway is that you're bringing that you're you're um bringing this together in one to one place to where you're one person where you're in reality i guess absolutely you have one reality well said. Well said. And, and that has been the, the journey, obviously, the journey not only to sobriety, but to sanity. It's assimilating all of those realities into one life that I can live with, that that mm-hmm. doesn't break me apart. And I do that, in, and this may not be um, understood to be a, a tenant of a 12-step philosophy, whereby we're trying to live in the present for 24 hours at a time, but I have to bring that reality as it reflects on the past the present and the future. Mm -hmm. So I have to go back and examine my perceptions in the context in which they were created, in those environments they were created. Otherwise, I don't have a chance of developing healthy perceptions and healthy coping mechanisms that would that, that would continue to allow me to be sober and, and sane and a connected individual and, and obviously useful to other relationships in society. And you know, um, something else that kind of came to my mind as we were talking about connection, you there was a there was a part in your book where you wrote about a roommate you had, a female roommate, and I think it was when you were going you were trying you were getting back into school again and mm-hmm. and she was a friend and you were both drinking, but she was honest about herself. She opened up to you in a way I think that other people hadn't. And Mm -hmm. even though you were drinking, it was like, that was a connection that you had with somebody that's, that, that's, that was somewhat meaningful for you to put it in the book like that. It was like, that was something that, that was helpful for you. Even, even you wrote that your drinking lessened during that time when you Mm -hmm. had that relationship with her. Can you talk about that a little bit? And did you learn anything from that experience or draw from that later in your life and your recovery? Well, you know, I think I think that's a, a great insight, John, and thanks for bringing that up. And 
and I, I remember it very well because at the time I was just plain lost, right? P- people who, I, I guess people who struggle with connection sometimes say that they feel lonely. And I think for me, it was beyond that. Yes, mm-hmm. I felt lonely, like something was wrong with me and my thinking was different, but I felt lost. I thought like many people in 12-step fellowships or in recovery say everybody else had an instruction manual and I had no, no, I had no clue as to what to do. I had no idea what to think. I had no idea how to behave. I, and I was, I was overly wrapped up in trying to guess what people's expectations were rather than being authentically me. And the safety of that relationship, and this is ultimately the, the, the great point that you made, it was the safety of that relationship that allowed me to be authentic and genuine and a bit introspective to look at myself in the context of that relationship to see what that meant. So that relationship, and I thank that individual for that to this day, gave me the, the, the courage and the strength and the safety to build and to grow and to learn. And ultimately what it was is validation, right? What, what we need to understand in this world, and I, I don't want to sound preachy here, but what we, you know, in the media, we go right to a solution. We want to go to a bullet point solution and tell people who's to blame and how to correct it. And ultimately, life's a lot more complex than that. And, and what ultimately helps most is validating people's experiences, not not approving them or disapproving them, but validating, accepting them and saying, okay, given the context of that situation, what do we together need to do now? And and without putting all of that language to it, that's what that relationship was about. It was about allowing someone to trust so that I could show myself to them and not be concerned about it. And ultimately, it's what the reason I wrote this book. It was about vetting the process. It's not just about being myself. It's about being up, putting myself out there and allowing another individual to be suggestive or to be critical or to to really give me some constructive accountability and feedback in a relationship. And, and that's what that was about. And and it did teach me lessons later on. It mm-hmm. took me a long time to learn those lessons, but they're lessons that, as you suggested, are, are essential for me to recall today because that's what it's about. And ultimately, that's what we're talking about with it. That's what I'm talking about with this book. It's a, it's a vetting process. And a mem- memoir, John, is really difficult to write. And, mm. and anyone who's done it knows so. But and I don't want to sound like I'm terminally unique here, but but I think it's even more difficult for someone who's been afraid of themselves or who's mm. been irreparably damaged by some existential de- uh, dilemma or some developmental interruption over life, right? The problem becomes even bigger because in order to accept oneself, they have to work really hard to get down to those causes and conditions and get to all those details. And I'm not talking about 40 and psychoanalysis on the couch. I'm talking about looking at causes and conditions in the context in which they, they, they existed. And mm. so to better know yourself, well, that increases the chances of finding flaws. Well, right. if you're flawed in the first place, it's an endless cycle. And, and it's that emotional and psychological pain that comes that most people can't endure that they bail out for whatever reason. They turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms, they check out, they isolate, they do all of those things. And and the lesson that I've come to learn is that I, when I feel safe, when I feel hmm. validated, I show myself to the world and ask them to vet me, to scrutinize, hey, is, is my thinking okay? And ultimately, that's what I'm doing with this memoir, which to me shows an unbelievable commitment um, to continuing the process. And I, I couldn't be more delighted about it. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the word safe and safety a few times there. And um, that was a question that you said is probably the most important question that we have to ask in our recovery is am I safe or do I feel safe? And Absolutely. so you must have gotten to a point because you were very honest in your book and I felt a connection with you. Um, I feel like I know you. And um, so you you must have gotten to a point in your life where you did feel safe to be to allow yourself that vulnerability to write like that, to allow people to hear your story and to connect with it. I did. I did. And as a matter of fact, it, it was a process. And if you, if you allow me just a moment, I can, I can describe that process okay. a little bit. I actually I attribute it <clears throat> to a time where I could came into secular 12-step recovery. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there was a time where I was watching all of the wonderful, exciting things that were going on in Toronto with regard to atheist and agnostic recovery and the battles fought at the grassroots level. And I, I got acquainted with some of the individuals up there. And I had been in touch with Roger C., who has published some some wonderful literature that that many of us read. And I noticed that many of the books that he's published are on the AA Beyond Belief literature page. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate that. And I, I wanted to come up and I wanted to meet these people in person. And that that's sometimes what I need to do. It's wonderful that we can connect virtually, but sometimes... I need to look somebody in the eye to be held accountable and to, and to feel safe. And that's what I did. So I, I told Roger I was going to come to Toronto. I'd like to meet some of the folks. And I was going to go to their Thursday night meeting. And he said, great. He said, um, would you like to give the lead? 
And I said, oh, shoot, you know, <laughs> I just wanted to come and be a, you know, I, I wanted to be a secular AA tourist. I, I just wanted to be a guest. <laughs> but of course, I was taught never to turn down a, a, a request. And I, of course, accepted graciously. And as I was flying there, I, I, I was purposely trying not to do any prep, but I decided I was going to jot a few notes down. So an hour and a half plane ride later, I was still writing. And, and I got to the group and I shared my experience, strength and hope. And ultimately, I felt accepted. It was one of the greatest reliefs I'd ever had. Um, I, I found that that unconditional positive regard from individuals who, who could share a similar path, but ultimately I found safe. Yeah. And that's what started that's what started my venturing into and I guess writing was secondary, investigating who I am. So after that event, Roger said, you know, I'm putting together this 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 great book and I'm wondering um, if you might contribute to it. And it was that do tell mm-hmm. stories by atheists and agnostic and AA. And I actually have contributed chapter 15 to that book. And it was where I started to learn how I could feel safe and to be vulnerable at the same time. And that's difficult in a recovery environment. That's difficult when one questions who their very self is. And it's sometimes even more difficult for men because of the way we're, yeah. we're socialized in community. So that was the start of that writing process. And after I'd written that chapter, um, I realized how much more work there was to be done. And in order for me to stay sober and sane, I knew I had to do that work. But the great news is that the story of this is that I had found the safety within those fellowships, within those individuals who understood how this could be done, who had offered me the hope that it could be done in a way that was that was in keeping with with healthy behavior that that launched me in on this on this path and and here we are three years later, and I've done an immense amount of work and I am empowered to do even more and you know um you talked also you wrote also in the book about um, and and this struck me because uh, i I was at a meeting not long ago where we basically went around and we shared our stories, and there are a couple of people that said, "Oh, there's nothing that bores me more than my own drunkalog." But you, you wrote in there, you said, uh, you wrote about that, that, you know, um, oh gosh, you know, our stories are important. <laughs> um, and, mm-hmm. and, a, and a lot of, a lot of your book is your personal story. And I needed to read that. It was, I don't know what it is, but mm. that honesty about our addiction, our active addiction that allows, I guess, the telling of it when you share it and openly, it, it helps build that safety factor. You begin to trust people, but it also helps other people. It, uh, it helps those people who are listening to your story to identify and relate, and they know that you've come out on the other side. Well, certainly, well, and that's well said. Certainly, to get to that place of safety that I believe is essential for anyone to be able to do this work, to, 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 to venture down this path, one has to be able to attach and relate to other people. You know, I, I've worked in the, the addiction treatment business for over a decade, and we give a lot of discussion and attention to the term stigma reduction, right? We, mm. we keep we keep telling people, boy, if we could just reduce the stigma, more people will, will come and get help. We just reduce the stigma, we will find a more appropriate funding to help these people. And there's nothing that goes further in terms of stigma reduction than someone honestly telling their story and openly and vulnerably and and authentically telling their story. It reduces stigma in ways that no other way can. We can can give all the scientific facts we want, but we know that that, uh, this being a cunning, baffling, and powerful disease, that's not always going to persuade people because addiction does not reside in the rational part of the brain. It resides in the emotional part, in the survival part of the brain. Mm. So, So that safety comes from stigma reduction and it is my belief that sharing our stories is, is is the healthiest way to get safe and to reduce that stigma. Now, having said that, what I know also is that my story has evolved over time because mm. I've done the work. Right. The story that I tell today is not the same story as I told 12 months into recovery. It's immensely different. It's more complex and it can be told from several different angles. And I think that that I've seen other people in the fellowships have similar experiences. Though, though what I worry about is that those who maybe tell the same story over and over <laughs> again for whatever reason. And I'm not being critical right. of them. I'm just wondering if that's helping with the safety and the stigma reduction part. That's well, all. isn't that interesting? Um, I, I've also noticed that um, you, you wrote in your book about your first five years in AA um, in the program where you were very traditional. You were, you know, you were wanting to connect with that higher power. I had that same experience where mm. I, w- I was doing the same thing. I was trying to, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the, the story is the same. The experience is the same, I guess. 
Um, the facts are the same. What happened is the same. But my understanding of those facts and what I've learned from those facts continue to evolve. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm assuming that's what's happened with you is that, you know, during that first five years of your recovery, you would share your story in one way. But where you're at now, you have a different understanding. You've learned some lessons. You've got some more, um, I guess, under, yeah, understanding of, of that story to, to add. I think that's well said. And I think I think the word that I would use for me anyway, is perception. I I have gained perception and perspective on what my experience have been. And this goes a long way. And what we're talking about here, obviously, is is a concept that is so (laughs) ingrained, at least in US society in this day and age, this concept of closure, everybody needs to work for closure, John is what I hear all the time. And I hear it in my profession, and I hear it in the world. And here's here's what I would, would say from my experience is that there's no such thing as closure. And when I work towards it, when I try to find that finality, then I have a problem. And that's exactly what you just illustrated from your experience, how your story has evolved over time. We're not looking for one final story. We're looking at our perceptions and the best we can get, and at least not only only the best can we get, but the ultimate thing that we should be looking to get is that perspective. I want to see the context in which my perceptions were formed. I want to see the context in which I turned to alcohol as a coping mechanism. Mm. And I want to see the context in in which it turned on me from being a medication to something that was very unhealthy and, and what the consequences consequences were for that. And that's what I'm looking for. It's not closure, it's context. And and that's what we're talking about. When our stories evolve, we're getting new context into the story. That means we're really doing the work. And to me, that that's where the excitement and the hope and, and, the, and come into working with individuals and continuing to go on this journey. Because sometimes, as, as many of us know, sometimes it'd be pretty easy to set aside. And ultimately, yeah. that was part of my story, setting some of these facts aside, because I just couldn't deal with them was not healthy in the long run. So getting that courage, getting that strength and and, and looking for that context is essential in, yeah. in working through these details. You know, as you were writing about the recovery process, um, you went into a lot of detail about what I what I would call the amends process. And you were you mm-hmm. you you um, actually would go to your family. You went to your um, wife and you went to your son and daughter and you at, I think you asked them the question about could you talk about that a little bit? Did you did you ask them what can I do or how to I impact you, but you went to them and you asked them a question. I recall. Absolutely, I did. I did, and I and I. The way I define the amends process is, I literally look up the word amends in the dictionary, and it means to change. I believe that um, apology can be part of that mm-hmm. right? because people talk about amends as an apology, but I think it's it's a change of behavior, and it's not just a commitment to change behavior; it's an ex- ex- exhibiting that behavior change. So, so, so when I go to my family, I offered restitution. Mm-hmm. What can I do to change? What can I do to better support you? What can I do? What are your goals? And what can I better do to support them? And those are the questions that I asked. So ultimately, I was asking my kids, how can I be a better dad? How can I be more supportive of your lives? How can I take away the emotional pain through behaviors in the present and the future mm-hmm. that, that can hopefully someday eclipse the experiences that I shared with you before? And ultimately, that was the question. What restitution can I offer at this time in terms of behavior change? And you alluded to it, but often, you know, the answer was seldom specific. Mm. The the answer was almost, almost always. I just, we just want you to be happy. We want you to be happy with who you are. We we want you to be comfortable and at peace and to have a mind that, that, that goes easy on you. So, so tell us how we can help you. I mean, that, that's how the amends process basically worked for me in most, in all but one case, family, friends, colleagues were all supportive in that way. Yeah. But to this day, I still I still pose that question, right? I, when I when I hear people talk about amends, I sometimes get confused and I associate mm. them, as I said, with apologies. Right. No, no, no. What behaviors am I willing to change today to accomplish the goal that I need to set out to to, to accomplish? And that's what's important to me. I think I found that some of the more uh, moving parts of the book was that description of of um, of coming back to your family like that, and and then your wife in particular, she actually got involved in a twelve step program as well. Can you talk about that a little bit and how what she's done and the work that she's done and how that impacted your your recovery? Sure, I can, and I'm I'm going to preface it by saying I can only do that to a degree because sure. it's her story to Absolutely. tell, of course. But but at first it was all about guilt because you know when when I first got sober, I didn't just wake up one morning and have a revelation. I went to treatment and I needed to go through detoxification and I needed to go through stabilization and I needed to go through an inpatient treatment episode in order to stabilize my life enough to even contemplate entering recovery. But as I did that, that program had suggested to my wife and family, well, as as your husband and father are doing this, we recommend that you two 
you mm-hmm. all go and, and explore your own paths to recovery. Mm-hmm. So mom, please go check out Al-Anon or Families mm-hmm. Anonymous. Kids, go check out Alateine. This will help you mm-hmm. to accept what's going on and to, and to obviously help you through those the psychological obstacles that you, you've had. And my wife immediately accepted that opportunity. So I, I think I went in on, to a treatment center on a Tuesday. I think Wednesday she had, she had accepted that recommendation and started a journey of her own. And it did any number of things. It, 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 number one, it made me feel guilty. Oh my gosh, who's, who's my behavior? <laughs> right. Now they, ha- they have to go treat themselves for my behavior? How insane is that? So there was a period of guilt, of course, but what, what I learned is that we immediately had a, a vocabulary that we could share. We talked about goals mm. and authenticity and vulnerability in ways that we were never able to, to share it before. And we obviously were able to treat each other with a little more respect. We we got to know each other at a level that we had not gotten to know each other before and trusted one another. And we, here's how we get back to the trust, trusted one another that their journey was appropriate for them. And it's been an incredible process for, for, for me because I've had that support in, in my family members. I also have had friends who have come out of the woodwork, as you imagine, over the mm-hmm. decades, say, sharing experiences that they've had with people in their lives. And we've had conversations along these very same levels that are that are ultimately validating, which means we, we grow a level of safety that allows us all to do our work together. And it's been phenomenal. So also, and you in your early recovery, you talked about, you know, I, I think it was the first five years where you were um, really entrenched and, and it was a useful time for you. It was something that you found valuable. But then there was a period of time where you started questioning things in the program. And you started feeling um, maybe apart from or not not as comfortable in the program as you now are. Can you talk about that evolution a little bit and some of the things about the 12 step program that you were questioning? Absolutely. Well, you're right. When I first came into the program, I was I was ready. I I was ready. I heard the message. I needed some suggestions. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this, you people. And of course, I was introduced immediately to a 12-step program when I was in in treatment. I'll do this, but two things. Number one, if you guys are lying to me, I'm never going to be able to trust anybody again. I knew that at that time in my life. I knew it. This was all about trust. Secondarily, I knew that if this wasn't the answer, I didn't have an answer. I was probably going to die. If I couldn't do this, I had nowhere else to go. So so there was a lot at stake. And I think the the, the, the literature in 12-step fellowships talks about being enthusiasts. What I would call myself is an immersionist. Mm-hmm. I immersed myself in that program. So in the first 365 days of the program, you know, I had a sponsor who said, you're going to do 90 and 90. Well, I, I did 450 <laughs> meetings in my first 365 <laughs> days. Yeah. Now, is that immersioning? Is that insanity? Is that control? Well, I didn't know where else to go. I didn't trust myself to do anything else. So I did. So I, I did, and I, you know, I, I read only program literature. I didn't look at mm-hmm. non-conference approved literature, and I tried, I tried to stay within those bounds. But, but, but after a while, I got uncomfortable with that because the message was was very one-sided, mm-hmm. and the message was rightly so always one of hope. But I wasn't always feeling that hope. I, I, I just didn't get it. And I tried to do those things. I knew that 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 religious or spiritual component was going to be very difficult for me. But, but I tried to take the message of just you know suit, suit up and show show up and fake it till you make it and all the rest mm-hmm. of that. And that's what I did. And ultimately. That may have been a stabilizing message and those activities that I do, I'm glad that I did them because I, I developed a community and a program for daily living that allowed me over time to quiet my mind and to stay sober. However, you're right. There was a time where I started questioning these things, right? I was, I remember this very clearly, John. I, I Every morning I would start my day and in the shower, I'd go through the prayers. Yeah. I'd go through the, the prayers of the program right. and they became rote after a while. I didn't know how much I was feeling. I'm so I was questioning my own integrity. Wait a minute. You're saying these things, but why are you saying them? Are you saying them because they're real or, or what's the deal? Are you really trusting in these things or, the, or what's going on? And I, I woke up one morning and I realized, wait a minute, the more I say these things, the worse I feel. I'm not feeling better. Mm-hmm. I'm not feeling more able to fight sobriety. I'm not feeling more connected. I'm feeling worse. And then, then I had the, the, the dawn ultimately was when I realized I had nobody to talk to about this. I went to people in the program that I trusted and they said, oh, keep coming back or, or you're doing it wrong or you haven't surrendered enough or you need to pray harder or mm-hmm. you're not praying rightly or you're trying to take back your will and all these things. They put it back on me like I was doing something wrong and I didn't see it. And ultimately what they did is they, they fostered that that shame component mm-hmm. in, my, in my very identity. Wait a minute, this is AA and I can't even get AA right? Everybody else seems <laughs> to be getting it right. I can't get this. So, so I had this crisis. I call it a crisis of faith and I use that term in, in a different way because I think religion has co-opted the term faith. I had a crisis of faith. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was doing anymore. Right? I thought I knew what I was doing all along. I was trying to stay sober. And as a result of staying sober, I was looking at those promises and they were starting to come true. But I was being inauthentic. And and ultimately, what I, what I realized was is that 
I question my integrity. And my integrity is, is, is simple, but it's threefold. Number one, integrity for me has to be that I'm incorruptible. I have to be honest. I have to be moral. I have to be valued. I have to be incorruptible. Secondly, I have to be sound. I, my thinking has to be rational. It has to be sound. And it has to be vetted by others. I, I can't just live in a vacuum. And lastly, I have to be complete. Right? I, I can't be divided anymore. I can't have issues that are bouncing around all the time that go unresolved. And I don't mean about that finality or that closure we talked about. I mean, I need the path to resolve things. Mm. And I realized that I wasn't there. So I I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I actually went and talked to a psychologist friend of mine, and I, I, I really <laughs> respected her. And with five minutes, she said, what are you talking about? Maybe you're not meant to believe that 12-step stuff. <laughs> right? And, it, and again, you know, go back to what I said before, when I first came into the treatment in the program, right? If, if what you guys are telling me isn't true, I'm not going to trust anybody ever again. Mm. And I'm probably going to drink and I'm going to die. And that's where I was. That was my existential crisis. How do I live in this support group that makes me that allows me to feel worse because it's it's triggering my shame. And what's the alternative? And it was at that time that I started investigating secular groups. And thankfully, I did because they, they, they were ultimately became my way just like yours, to mm -hmm. stay in this process, to stay engaged, to be held accountable and to, to be uh, um, available to a community of recovery that, that can sustain us. And you talked about a, a few specific things that I found interesting. I, um, I think I am still um, at a place in my, in my recovery where I am still learning to evolve in, into a more secular approach. And I've got I had probably decades of time um, really buying into the, the, all of it. Um, so anyway, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of things that one of those was the discussion of defects of character and being re-traumatized. And I'm wondering if maybe you can talk about how how you began to think about defects of character and and um, that whole process of being re-traumatized in AA and how you kind of... <laughs> sure, sure. Well, you know, there, there's this spiritual axiom in AA and in 12-step recovery, right? If there's something wrong, there must be something inherently wrong with us. We have we have a part in everything that, that mm. makes us feel bad is that spiritual axiom. And I, I understand it philosophically, but ultimately it doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't work. And I can, I can make any number of arguments about people who have been harmed by others that mm. it was no fault of their own. Right. There was no spiritual axiom involved. They were just hurt and traumatized and abused. I mean, that's just what happened. So, so this notion that ego deflation at depth mm. has to be part of everyone's experience in a 12-step fellowship, I think is really quite dangerous because mm. not everybody has an ego to begin with that's right. strong enough to withstand that process. Some right. people come in with a fragmented sense of self, including myself, yeah. or almost no sense of self because I had adapted to everybody's expectations so elaborately I had no clue as to where I started and where I ended. Um, so that, that, that to me, that ego deflation at depth notion was incredibly dangerous and harming. And and it wasn't, and no one ever pointed their finger at me and said, we're going to deflate your ego. But that was the message. And that was the message at every turn, that message is in a lot of the literature, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I, I had to check this philosophy because we have, we talk about being terminally unique. Right. And it wouldn't be unusual for someone who, if I asked them to be judgmental about me in the fellowship, would say, wait a minute, you're starting to think that you're different than us if you don't, if you can't take your ego deflation in depth. So I had to check that, right? I had to vet that experience. And, and I did. And I, and I saw it in any number of different ways. And I also saw it in my profession. I work in the addiction treatment industry, and I specifically worked at a behavioral health hospital where we focused on dual diagnosis. So those with not only an addiction right. disorder, but also a mental health disorder. And I saw a lot of people come in with PTSD and other, what I would say, developmentally impactful experiences in their life that might prevent them from getting there. And ultimately what we would do in treatment, and I'm saying this in a general way, I, I certainly do not want to disparage any employers that I've worked for in the past, but what we do in treatment is it's typical. We, we bring some into a treatment setting and immediately we throw them into a group and we say, tell us your story. Tell, tell us everything about yourself. Tell us the truth about your drinking and the consequences. And to me, that's one of the most traumatizing things we can do. We do it in AA too. We, right, we, we ask people, we, you know, when someone comes to their first AA meeting, we sometimes break out into a special first step meeting and, oh, and everyone tells their story and we say, now tell us yours. And this person sometimes, certainly in treatment, may be still going through detox. They don't have the capacity to do this, but we've also we've immediately made it unsafe for them. And it's and it's that ego deflation at depth. We, we, we have this assumption that if you can just talk authentically about your story, all the secrets come out of the closet and everything will be great. But here's the, here's the, here's the, point that nobody talks about. Sometimes it was those secrets that kept us alive, right? Uh, those secrets were our coping mechanisms. I'm not going to tell you how defective I am. 
I, I can't do it because right. it is existentially going to kill me. So I'm going to keep that to myself and I'm going to keep these secrets and I'm going to adapt and I'm going to do what you think I should do, but but I'm never going to get down to that layer. So this is a, this may have sounded a little complicated, but but ultimately what, what that notion is, is that we're asking people to do things before they're feeling safe enough to yes. do them. Good point. Do you know, and I'm glad that our group did this, our group decided to stop that practice when there's a newcomer at the meeting to share our stories. You know, I think in the Midwest, that's the common routine. You know, you have a new mm. person at the meeting, everybody shares their stories and they talk to that person. We felt like it was making that new person in the meeting feel uncomfortable, like all the attention was directed on them. Mm -hmm. And we found that it would be better just to create a safe environment where they could get a feel for the group, our dynamics and how we interact with each other. And I think that's actually worked better for us. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if maybe that, you know, we, we are helping in that way by not putting that person in a position of having to, you know, shame them. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Well, I, I would suggest that what you're doing is brilliant. And I can take it back to what we talked about earlier. It, you know, it has to do with, um, it has to do with that notion that we are creating this, this safe spot. And to create a safe spot, we need to reduce the stigma. And the best way to reduce the stigma is for someone who understands and has worked on their story and can give a coherent narrative of their story, shares vulnerably and authentically their story. That doesn't mean we should ask the newcomer to do it. But if we ask people to do it, right, we have people who have are more mature and more experienced in their recovery and are comfortable doing it, that will help to build that level of safety. But but that doesn't mean we should ask the newcomer to do it at the same time. Right, right. They have in no position to do it wherever. So I, I applaud your group. I think it's brilliant. I think you're providing that extra level of safety. Some people would say, well, wait a minute, but you haven't engaged that person. And I mm. would disagree entirely. I would say we've engaged them more because we built a trust or started to build a trust that maybe never would have come and maybe keeps people from staying in, in 12 step fellowships for any amount of time. Right. I just want people to feel welcomed and comfortable there. And I think that that first step meeting that we were doing here in the Midwest kind of kind of put the people on the spot. I don't know, but that, that's what mm -hmm. that's what we decided to do. I want to say I found you very, very interesting. Um, I could relate with you on so many levels. Um, I mean, you describe yourself as an as an introvert. But when you look at your career, you were doing some things like when you were working in Chicago um, that were really I, almost extra, extroverted behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about parallel universes, having those two components at the same time. I mean, it's endlessly fascinating. How had you had, did you ever come to any kind of a conclusion, any kind of understanding about what was going on? What enabled you to be the introvert? insecure person, but at the same time being so dominant on the floor of in, in Chicago? <laughs> well, I, I think that's an interesting question, and I'm not sure that I, I, I've resolved that yet. Yeah. I'll tell you, I've done an immense amount of work on that. Because, <laughs> as, you're gonna, as you're reading this, I mean, you're seeing something that I think a lot of friends and family of mine would attest to over, over the years. I would describe myself as introverted, and they would right. look at me and they say, are you crazy? <laughs> look at what you've done, right? I mean, you're talking about your job, but I also used to be a volunteer at any number of organizations where I'd have to be at the podium in front yeah, of hundreds of people yeah. and I would give extemporaneous talks. And yeah. you know, an introvert would never do that. An introvert would cave in on themselves and, and fret about it so much that it might lead to anxiety or panic right. attacks. So, so th there was, yeah, there was that unbelievably irreconcilable difference that, that couldn't occur. And of course, I worked on this and I always thought myself as an introvert. And when I first uh -huh. got sober and started doing the work, I started taking what, what, is known in the um, behavioral health circles as the Myers-Briggs inventory. It's a way of looking at personality and characterizing personality in different forms. And, and it, it's a four-part designator. And I stands for introvert and E stands for extrovert. Every time I took that test, and I would, I would venture to say I've taken it at least 50, if not 100 times in my lifetime, it always starts with the letter I. It always says that okay. I'm introverted. But as you... Uh, highlighted, I have to be careful with that. Uh -huh. I have to be really careful with that because I have to ask myself, is that an adaptation? Is that a way that I stay safe? Right. Or is that really the true David and his essence in the past, present, and future? And ultimately, I sometimes don't know the answer. Right. right? What I can tell you is that adoptees, because of this attachment disorder that some of us have or this lack of trust, are diagnosable, clinically diagnosable later in life as many things. So the majority, I shouldn't say the majority, but of, of the adoptees who get diagnosed with a mental health diagnosis, the, the most prevalent diagnosis is ADHD. What I would argue is that in, in many cases, it's genuine, and I don't want to question the right. doctors and the, the mental health professionals who could do that, but oftentimes it's an adaptation. Right. It's it's a hypervigilance to a situation where, uh-oh, 
everywhere I go, I, I can't trust anything. So I have to be hyper vigilant. And, and my head has to do 360 degree turns all around me to make sure that I'm safe. Right. And that might lead to the symptoms, the criteria of ADHD, right? So, so I could, I could argue that I could argue that sometimes I probably meet the, the diagnostic criteria for anxiety for the very same reasons that I might meet ADHD. So when you ask that question, yes, I think of myself as an introvert, but I have lots of examples where I'm not. Right. So as I, as I'm, as I'm writing this story, as I, as I'm learning this story, of these parallel universes con- converging, this confluence, is it possible that I'm both at different exactly, times? Exactly. And the answer is, is absolutely. And it's that duality, right? It's Again, I t- tie this back to I'm not looking for closure. I'm looking for context. And the context right. is that duality, yes? Yes, sometimes I can be very extroverted. And sometimes I find, in, in, especially sometimes in some of these settings, when I'm, when I'm in a one-to-one conversation with an individual, I can get very animated and, and totally, when right. I'm done with the conversation, forget what I talked about. And that would... That would uh, actually pretend the label extroversion, right? You're in the moment, you flowed with it, you were animated, you were you were uh-huh. you were energetic, you you weren't overly introspective and, and it didn't curtail your discussion. So yes, I think I think that's a great point. And I think I've learned a lot of that over time. And actually, you know, I, just to share an anecdote with you, I don't know if you've seen any of these YouTube videos, but there are a bunch of YouTube videos out there with people on this 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 amusement park ride called the slingshot. Oh, yeah, you talked about, yeah. Right? And ultimately, the slingshot is where two people are, are strapped into this mechanism, and there are these two monstrous or, or multiple monstrous springs on either side, and they're, they're pulled into this pit, and ultimately, when they're released, they're hurtled into space, and then they bounce around on these, these coils for a while. And, and I th- I'll never do that, by the way. <laughs> right, right. Something that I probably wouldn't do, but at the same time, I'm very intrigued about doing right. it. So, but I saw this video of these two sisters who did it, and, I've, and, and it was typical of what you're talking about in that duality. Right. And these sisters may have been twins. I mean, they, they had so many personality traits that were similar. It was, it was, it provided a great contrast. And the one sister, as soon as it happened, she looked like she was in ecstasy. She had this peaceful smile on her face. Her eyes were closed. It was like nirvana to her. This was the experience of a lifetime. It's as though she had she had she had found some some different dimension to life. And her sister next to her is screaming every expletive she could ever imagine. Get me down, stop. <laughs> I wasn't ready, right? She just she just couldn't take the journey, but this is happening at the same time. And ultimately, that duality is what happens in my mind and in many people's minds at the same time, right? This, right? this, this recovery thing is a great experience, but if right. I think too hard about it, it's one of the scariest things I've ever done, right? Exactly. The self-examination process is wonderful, and it's providing the basis for me to be more vulnerable and trusting and vetting myself to others, but at the same time, it's the scariest ride I've ever been on, right? I, I, I talked about that, that shame piece and the, the memoir being really difficult for people with a fragmented sense of self, all of that is there. So what I've come to believe is that these are great indicators of where I should look but I have to go look for the context to figure out what's going on. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. The, the tests may say that I'm introverted, but I have lots of experiences that would suggest that I, if I am, I'm not always introverted. Exactly. I think I, I, I can say the same for myself. I was actually looking at that part of my life uh, last year, and I, I'd come to the conclusion that I'm not going to put the label on me one way or the other, because I can probably be both. Maybe I'm more introverted, but on the other hand, I do a podcast. Like, <laughs> you know, I do a lot of other things <laughs> that aren't so introverted. So Exactly. Exactly. Um, Talking about scary rides, um, I think where I'd like to kind of um, wind things up at is this must be a pretty recent occurrence for you. It's discovering your biological family. Is mm-hmm. this something that is just like in this last year that you've you started um, meeting your biological uh, family? Well, it's been relatively recent. Now, I've had mm-hmm. some information about my biological family, but it was all non-identifying information. So mm-hmm. at the time I wasn't feeling well about the time, just shortly before I, I had to make a decision to do something to get sober, I got some health history of my family right. because we were looking at whether or not I, I it was susceptible to seizures or if right. there were some other things in my family I needed to look at. And and so I got that information initially and then I put that on the shelf, right? Because again, it was too I was too fragmented to deal with that. And mm-hmm. of course, again, the expectations of society were telling me, hey, David, you know, that's a separatist issue. You, you, that's not an issue. That has nothing to do with your sobriety. That has nothing to do with your mind frame. Don't look at it. So so I put it away for a while. But then I came back to this. And once I, once I started again on this latest venture into getting down to causes and conditions, I said, boy, I have to maybe not know everything because everything is not knowable. Mm-hmm. But I have to know that at the end of the day, I tried to get that information. I need to. Mm-hmm. I need it for me and I need it for my kids because my kids also deserve right. that that's genetic right. Good point. and character 
psychological information, right? I don't want there to be this huge gap in the family tree for the rest of everybody's lives. We, I need to fill in as much as I possibly can. In other words, I need to find a context for what these experiences look like. So I, I went down that road and I, I learned that I, that, um, I could petition the, the, the state of Wisconsin and a judge get granted me um, access to all of my uh, social worker files with the state of Wisconsin regarding my adoption. So I got to learn the name of my mother and I got to learn the name of some of her friends and relatives. And although paternity was never established when I was adopted, i.e. my father's name was not on the birth certificate because he denied right. that he was he was my father, his name was written in my mother's writing on the social worker's form and I got his name. So I went down that route and I, I did. I, I, I searched for family and I learned sadly that both my mother and my father had passed before right. I started my journey. But as it turned out, there were other people involved. It never even occurred to me, right? I, my mind never allowed me to go on to go beyond that fact. Why did my parents give me up and what are they doing today? Well, it never occurred to me I might have other siblings out there. And as I, as I started my search, one of the first things in the social worker's file that came to me was a half-sister from my mother's side who was actually looking for me. Not only was she looking for me, but she wanted a big brother. Uh-huh. I mean, it never even occurred to me that here I had this this relationship, this parallel universe relationship that had been ignored throughout my life. And actually, I'd been connected all along. And now uh-huh. I'm connected at a level that I never dreamed was even possible. We have a relationship and we are brother and sister. And we've shared a lot of details about the family. And it's, it's been an immensely, I guess, enlightening journey by putting all of those facts or all of those realities into the fold. Without that, I'm not sure that I could have gotten as clean an assimilation of those parallel universes as I have now. But I have relationships with these siblings. I have that sister, another sister on on my mother's side. I have a relationship with a brother on my father's mm-hmm. side, and the information keeps coming. So I have relationships with aunts. And for a guy who never felt he was connected, yeah. I look at this, and people from the outside look at me and say, David, you're most more connected than most human beings on this planet. Do you realize that? And of course, I need that feedback. I need to be reminded of that because you know what? I am. I am connected up and down. I'm connected in an intricate number of ways. And I, I think about the string theory, theory of the universe, and I know there are those scientists out there who think it's disproved, but I, I have this graphic that I'm connected in all these different ways. If I just acknowledge the reality of those connections, they can be healing as opposed to something that is harming or something that disallows my wellness. That's what I was thinking. I could I could see the healing in in there, and just having some understanding of your parents' stories. Um, when you were relating the story of your mother, it brought me to tears. But um, you know, it's good to cry sometimes. <laughs> but but having that understanding um, must have brought. Did that bring some healing to you? Having some understanding of your parents' stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and it wasn't just that in a vacuum. I mean, I, I'm someone who studies life. So I actually went and at the time I was getting this information about my mother, I went and re- read a book by a woman named, by the name of Ann Fiesler. It was called The Girls Who Went Away. And it talked about the women in the United States who for that period of time from the 50s until 1973 when Roe versus Wade was passed, who society suggested their lives would be better if they relinquished these babies. And it told stories from the relinquishing mother's point of view. So it opened up a, a, an entirely new door of empathy to me. Whereas before my, my mind automatically would say, yes, you know, she would, something was wrong with me. And if something was, wasn't wrong with me, I was interfering in their life and I was inconvenient and I, all of these things. Well, it gave me a new perspective to consider perhaps my mother was as much a product of the times as I may be a product of these times. And knowing in context what societal beliefs were, what some religious beliefs were, what practices were in the social working industry allowed me to look at my mother and her experiences in a totally different perspective. And it offered that context that I needed. So I I came to learn, without giving away too many details Mm -hmm. in the book, I came to learn that this wasn't a selfish choice or irresponsible choice that my mother made. It was made in the context of what society expected, what families expected, etc. And it wasn't unusual for men in that time to deny what was going on. What I can tell you just as a hook is that today's DNA testing is dispelling a lot of um, those rumors and a lot of those secrets. There, there, there are a lot of secrets that people thought they might take to the grave with them that are being unearthed by DNA testing. And, and not to be a teaser to my book, but that is one of the experiences that I had in looking at those relationships that, mm-hmm. that, that existed in those facts that existed in my life. Absolutely. The other thing I would tell you, John, is what I've come to ultimately understand is, and I don't, and I don't, want to be cute mm-hmm. and use this term disparagingly, 
but it is a miracle that I am still around. Given what I have learned about my family's history with regard oh, to yes. alcoholism and substance use disorder yeah. and possible mental illness, yeah. I am fortunate to be here and my children are fortunate to be here as well. We are survivors in the truest sense and I am totally grateful for having gotten that information to understand that at, at a level that I, beyond the simple level that I understand that as, as someone in long-term recovery, right. recovering from a, from a chronic illness that, that tends to kill a lot of people. It's even more than that. And it's given me a gratitude for what my genetic heritage has suffered through. And it, it provides, quite frankly, inspiration to me to keep doing the deal every day. And all of this that you've learned every in your entire journey from the beginning to where you are right now has been bringing these two universes together into one place, into what I would call a reality, the reality that you refer to as your higher power. And that makes so much sense to me because it, it, it having that reality, that sense of reality of the truth is what brings you together as a whole person, I think. I think that's uh, well said. I could not have been more concise and said it more articulately myself. And it, it is it is exactly the philosophy that I need to live each and every day. I, I have to ask myself each and every day, what is my reality today? What do I know today? Because I have a mind, well, for whatever reason, be, because of substance use disorder, because of relinquishment as a youth, because of attachment problems, because of trust issues, I have a mind that sometimes confabulates things and sometimes has an unhealthy perspective on the way things are. So I have to find that reality. And again, part of that higher power is reaching out to others and asking them to vet me and to check me on my reality. Is what I'm thinking within the realm of possibility or am I just way out there on a plank right so yeah absolutely that, that, that gives me the strength each and every day well what a beautiful book thank you so much for writing it and sharing your story with the rest of us do you do you plan on going to Toronto in August for the uh, international convention I will be there as a matter of fact I pre-registered at the last convention down in Austin so I've, I've been ready to go I have flights and lodging and I look forward to that Fantastic. I'm going to go too. I've gotten, I'm I'm very, I'm 99.9% sure. I'm waiting for my boss to say, yes, you get two weeks off because my wife and I are thinking we're going to drive from Kansas City to Toronto and kind of make a nice driving vacation. And it's been a long time since I've taken two solid weeks off together. So that'll be fun. And I look forward to meeting you. Um, Absolutely. As do I. It'll be so much fun. As do I, John. Thank you so much for for having me on today. I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me to share more with your listeners, um, the common thread that I think many of us have. And thank you for all that you do. You And I mean this sincerely. You do noble work in a space that people are looking for what you have to offer. So thank you for that. Well, that's it for another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Thank you for joining us, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Parallel Universes is available at Amazon, and uh, I think that you'll enjoy the book. If you think about it, please consider uh, contributing a dollar or two a month to uh, support the podcast just by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash AA Beyond Belief. Thank you, everybody.